Okay, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you to BCE Loudon's online classroom. Today we'll be talking about pollinators with Norma Lee Martin. I am Barbara Bailey, the Community Engagement Coordinator in charge of the Master Gardeners. We'll introduce Norma Lee. She's been a Master Gardener since 2008. She has over 8,000 volunteer hours as of the end of last year and probably cl close to hundreds more already this year. She is the lead of the demonstration garden out at Ida Lee for the Master Gardeners. So I will hand the microphone over to Norma Lee and please enjoy your presentation on pollinators. Wait, real quick, we're gonna take questions at the end of the session. So if you'll see the chat box down, it's either at the bottom or the top of your screen. It should say chat. Please type a question in there and we'll take the questions at the end of the session. So thank you. Normally it's all yours. Normally. Uh-oh. She's muted, Barb. Okay, hang on. Normally you need to un, there you go. Uh, okay, now I got it. <laughs> Hello everybody. It's, it's weird, uh, you know, pushing all these, or clicking all these icons and nothing happening. Anyway, um, it's like a fall day out there on this spring day. So welcome everybody. We'll talk a little bit about pollinators today. And what are pollinators? The birds, the bees, the bugs, the wind, uh, the people, uh, Barb, it's not moving. Barb? Yes? It's not, the slide is not moving. Okay, hang on, it might take a while to catch up to you. Okay, I'll just go ahead and. All right, I took the control away and now I was gonna give it back, so hang on a second. Okay, try it, try it now. Okay, hang on. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. We will talk about what is pollination, why it's so important, who is involved, and what you can do. Okay, let me try it again. Yeah, this is, this is difficult for me. I'd rather be in the garden. There you go. Pollination is. Pollination occurs when poll pollen is moved within flowers or carried from flower to flower by pollinating animals, such as birds, bees, bats, butterflies, or by the wind. Um, this transfer allows the production of seeds and fruits, or it's the transfer of pollen from a male part of a plant to a female part, enabling fertilization. Now, now I did not move that on my own. Sorry about that, folks. It's uh, okay. We're going to move it one slide. Okay. Pollinators. Bats, birds, bees and wasps, butterflies and moths, insects. Now, um, there's also the wind. There is also the movement of people walking by plants. Um, and when, when we list bees, it's not just honeybees we're talking about. We're talking about uh, native bees which there are a lot of in, in the United States and in North America and worldwide, actually. Um, right now there's um, Blue Orchard Mason bees out. Um, I'm a, a native bee advocate, so I may talk a little in excess about native bees. So the next slide is a good pollinator. Good pollinator needs to be highly mobile, um, flit, flitting from flower to flower. Sticky is a good, a good uh, trait. Other, other, um, other things besides being sticky is, is being hairy. Some bees, some insects are hairy. Some bees have a special structure called a corbicula, which is a pollen basket. Um, and they uh, need to be adapted to feeding on flowers, uh, pollen and nectar. 
Okay. Why pollination is so important. Staple crops rely on pollinators. Most of um, most of the stuff that we eat is comes from uh, poll being pollinated. It is said that um, that bees are responsible for one out of every three bites of food that we eat. Billions of dollars of products, of course, depend on pollination. Our ecosystems, of course, depend on pollination. Um, and and uh, fruits, beverages, that happened. Wait a second, sorry about that. Uh, fruits, uh, food, uh, grains, beverages, they all depend on pollination. Um, let's see. Good pollinate. Oh, we already did. No, we already did that one. I'm I'm not doing this very well. Okay, here we go. What pollinator nators need? They need food, water, and shelter. Um, now, the food is the is the flowers part, and different different um, pollinators are uh, adapted to different type of of plants. For instance, the mason bees. Uh, feed on uh, fruit tree plants, uh, flowers. Uh, summer leaf cutter bees like legume or peas or bean type flowers. Um, you see lots of bumblebees on, on many of the flowers in your, in your garden. Those are, of course are all native bees. Um, the one thing about um, when you plant flowers, the best thing for an, a pollinator is to plant clumps of flowers from like three and to four and a half feet wide. Um, so that, and, and, and if they're bright, that's even better because then the bees, if they're used to one type of, of flower for food, they don't have to go too far to get more food. Um, water, you can use a, uh, of glazed or ceramic saucer or concrete saucer, put some rocks and sand in it uh, and, and plant that on the ground somewhere within your garden. And that's, that's a good, um, good water for them. They like to, to perch on, on the rocks and the sand and even a little bit of salt um, is a good minerals. They find minerals from that. Um, the shelter, you plant a variety of plants that provide blooms from spring to fall, keeping the plants close together in clumps. Um, if you provide uh, a canopy of plants, but leave a little bit of a bare ground um, for underground tunnels and hollowed out wood or store-bought houses, that, that's good shelter. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the the slides again. Okay, just like us, food, water, shelter. Pollinator threats, habitat loss, and that's been big in the in the uh, news for the last couple of years. Um, invasive species, uh, that's something that we can't seem to do much about because it comes in through the the shipping containers and and mail and um, I think the, so I was reading about some pests that just came in a package from, from somewhere that had come from a package somewhere else. So you never know. Um, but if we, we help to protect these, these, uh, animals and insects, um, uh, the better for us, um, we can, um, plant native to keep the invasive species out. Uh, we want to keep pesticides at a minimum. Um, if you're going to spray a pesticide, you need to know what you're spraying and why you're spraying it. Um, you need to identify the pest and see if uh, pesticide is, is the proper thing to do or if a nice uh, burst of water from your hose will do like they get rid of aphids really easy if you use a, a, a blast of water. 
so you don't have to use pesticides necessarily. Um, disease and parasites, you know, if you if you do if you do plant native, those you know native to your area, especially, you're gonna have less uh, opportunity for disease and parasites because that's what native. That's the good thing about native plants is they're adapted to your area and they don't um, don't get disease easily. Um, if they, the native plants, especially those that provide nectar and larval food, um, there are uh, free eco regional pollinator planting guides that you can get. Um, you just have to, you know, Google that. Um, you can install houses for bats and native bees and, um, and, and help keep them clean and to keep those parasites out. The nesting boxes, um, you see a lot of those store-bought nesting boxes um, and they're great. Um, and because people are, are thinking about them. Um, a lot of people don't realize that those nesting boxes, you can't clean them out easily. And if they're left with last year's goop in them, there may be uh, disease and parasites that have gone in and eaten the, the bee larva and, and made their own nests in there. So they can be um, there waiting. So those kind of things you wanna, you wanna watch out for. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen one that you could take the back off of and clean the nesting tubes out. Um, you could do, a, uh, uh, again, a blast of water from your, your hose, um, but you need to remember to do that. Um, you can also uh, get, what you see in that slide right there are um, cardboard nesting boxes. And uh, there's a great website called crownbees.com that uh, I get a lot of my supplies from. And they have the cardboard nesting tubes and um, some of them have inserts that can go in. And you can take, you can, if you're gonna, if you wanna cultivate and, or if you wanna harvest the uh, cocoons, overwinter them and you know, turn them out the next spring, this is the kind of nesting tube that you want because you can open it up and get the cocoons out. Keep the cocoons over the winter in a, in a, um, the right environment, the right climate. Um, they have humid bee boxes and that you can keep in a cold area or a cool area like your garage. Um, oh, I kept them in our storage room at the dem demonstration garden at Ida Lee in Leesburg. And it's cool in there over winter. And in the spring, um, I kept checking and pretty soon there's little mason bees uh, walking around inside the, the uh, bag and it was time to let them go. Um, so if you're providing them that kind of a winter uh, habitat, that's great. But you can also leave your plants up over the winter. Um, your, especially your seed, your uh, flowers that have seed heads, like black-eyed Susans, a uh, cone flower, uh, anything that has a seed head on it is good food and good uh, habitat for critters and, and insects and bees. Um, reducing the area of lawn grass. Boy, have I seen a lot of uh, advertising during this <clears throat> lockdown about um, changing your yard into a meadow. You know, people need something to do. So this is a good time to do it. Just, um, I, I know there's a lot of HOAs out there, but taking an area and making it um, with wildflowers, uh, is a good good way to um, help the bees, uh, except the solitary bees, not the not the honey bees. Those are um, you know the hives. Um, geez, I I know there's more to talk about. Limit pesticide use, like I told you before. The uh, Omri label 
is the Organic Materials Research Institute. If it has an OMRI label, that means that it's, uh, it's organic and it's uh, tested and listed. So that you'll know that it's a good, uh, good pesticide to use. Uh, we, uh, VT, Virginia Tech has a, a, a PMG pest management guide that has listings of, of the chemicals and it always lists um, from safest to extreme. So you could go online and probably look at that. Plant your pollinator garden. Um, flowers throughout the year for a steady source of, of nectar and, um, and pollen. You know, it's just amazing how many plants there are out there. And you can, you can't, you have, with a little research, you can have uh, color and, and uh, food for insects from spring to fall um, in all variety of colors and shapes and all stages of the pollinator life cycles. Um, I'll say that there is a, and we know this worldwide, there's an uh, evidence that pollinating animals have suffered from loss of habitat, chemical misuse, introduced in invasive plant and animal species and diseases and parasites. So uh, many pollinators are federally listed species, sp listed species, meaning that there's evidence of their disappearance in natural areas. I've also been reading about insects, bees, um, that were thought to have disappeared um, are appearing again, which is kind of, um, you know, warms my heart. Um, so let's see. Um, there's other places um, uh, you can join a pollinator partnership. Uh, you can the Xerces uh, uh, .com, which is uh, is based out of um, Arizona or New Mexico, something like that. And but it's all bee friendly and it's great. They have a great email. Um, you can go to um, Virginia Tech has has some publications um, on on the native bees and and honeybees too. I know there's you know I don't know a lot about honeybees. Um, I just have you know I found that um, um, the native bee was in you know not recognized. I've always been in. Uh, in like the underdog and that's what the native i felt the native bee was but more and more people are becoming aware of them um let's see um pollination is so important um not every species of plant requires uh an animal mediated pollination pollination service um majority of crops that we like most to eat and provide most of our nutrients like fruits, vegetables, and nuts require animal mediated pollinator pollination. Um, our diets would be um, severely limited if we didn't have them. Um, I know that uh, wheat is wind pollinated. So there are uh, and there are uh, plants that have specific pollinators like alfalfa has the alfalfa leaf cutter bee. So they, those kind of bees are actually commercially um, harvested or grown for specific reasons for uh, like in Canada for the, the alfalfa fields, they, they, um, they get those bees, they make those, or, you know, they, raise those bees specifically for that purpose. Um, and with, with our unpredictable shifts in temperature and, and precipitation, climate change disrupts the timing of plant and pollinate, pollinators in relationships. And high levels of carbon dioxide can force some plant species to have delayed and or shorter blooming periods. I've seen a lot of change in 
especially this season in plant um, blooming and um, it just portends uh, change, you know. Uh, so some some plants that shouldn't be blooming now are blooming now. Some plants aren't blooming fully. Uh, I see some trees not um, not filling out like they ordinarily do. So things are changing, and and we have to keep our eyes on it and and watch for it if we want to save our pollinators. Sometimes, sometimes uh, I refer to pollinators as plants. Um, I'll say uh, African blue basil is a great pollinator. So some plants that have that that the bees are really attracted to, that's called a pollinator too. But you can distinguish it by the word plant. Um, wait a second. Native, sorry about that. Native plants provide a clean, fresh water source. And I have a, I keep a little um, water garden in, I have a bee hotel in the vegetable area in the demonstration garden. And I keep a large ceramic glazed uh, saucer, like a plant saucer. And I use glazed because um, oh, plastic blows away or and it's just not as attractive but uh, terracotta the water evaporates too quickly and I put uh, rocks big rocks and small rocks in so the the bees can perch on it I keep it right below the the bee hotel and also <clears throat> we have a butterfly garden and I'll keep a it's a um, I don't know where it came from, but along the way somebody donated it. But it's a it's a molded hard plastic, uh, and it must be a, like a puddler they call them uh, for butterflies. And I keep that at the end of the butterfly garden with, but I put a, a, some sand in it, and I keep a little salt in our tool shed to add it every maybe a little bit of salt once a month for the minerals for the butterflies um, and other nectar. Um, and that's, of course, through plants, flowers. And there's a picture of our butterfly garden, actually. Uh, it's the Autumn Joy Sedum, uh, the Goldenrod Solidago, and um, I don't know what that other is, hyssop, I think. Um, and that's all great food for the butterflies and it's a lot of fun to watch them in the summertime the butterflies and the bees this is a great slide because it's got everything you need to to think about no not everything but the basics using native plants planting a variety a different um different flowers have are attracted to different types of insects like uh, you know, a trumpet flower or a, a cardinal type flower has kind of a tube and, a, and hummingbirds or um, hummingbird moths or any moth with the long antennae um, or proboscis are, you know, are attracted to those types of plants. Most flowers uh, that are single petaled uh, are better because the plant is uh, using all its energy to produce pollen and nectar as opposed to making pretty petals like for zinnias and dahlias, which are gorgeous plants, but they're not that great of a pollinator. Um, different variety of flower shapes and colors, and that's gonna attract different types of, of bees and, and uh, other insects, birds. Um, here you can go. It says avoid modern hybrids, especially those with doubled flowers. Um, uh, the since pollen, nectar, and scent can be lost in the cultivation product process. Um, yeah, the hybrids uh, hybrids uh, have kind of like the uh, the nectar and pollen hybridized out of them. So um, be aware of that, and you can always find that information 
in, uh, if you go to a catalog looking for flower seeds or something, um, they tell you all the information you'll need. Uh, deer resistant, you know, the plant, uh, the, the height, um, whether they need sun. So they'll tell you all that kind of great stuff. Build a bee condo. Leave dead trees or limbs to create nesting habitat for bees. Um, avoid using pesticides if at all possible. Um, you need caterpillars and the nibble leaves that go with them uh, if you want butterflies. Uh, help pollinators find the plants they need by planting them in clumps rather than singly. Clustering plants also shortens the distance the pollinators need to travel. Provide bare ground um, or shallow bird bath filled with soil, sprinkled with sea salt and kept moist to create a source of water and min minerals for pollinators. Include plants for caterpillars. Uh, they are surprisingly fussy eaters and require particular host plants. Everybody, everybody's aware of monarch uh, butterflies and milkweed being their, their host plant. Um, they're the only ones that know not to eat where the sticky poison is, um, which is in the ribs. So, but there's different kinds of milkweed too. There's swamp milkweed, there's common milkweed, and there's others that I don't, I don't even know about. But uh, they particularly like um, swamp milkweed, which is, looks different than, than common milkweed. But uh, having a, a, you know, a variety of milkweeds is good. Also, your dills and your parsleys, fennels, um, the um, swallowtail. Um, is it the swallowtail? I think the swallowtail likes that. Um, they look kind of like uh, the uh, monarch butter, uh, monarch caterpillar too. Also, there's other, we have a pipe vine, uh, which is a vine that um, is a host plant to the swallowtail, pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar. And, um, you know, that's gorgeous. The little, the little flowers look kind of like um, Dutchman pipes, if you've seen that flower. And uh, the, the caterpillars, it's in the summer, it's covered with black caterpillars. And, but they all turn into beautiful blue butterflies. So you can, have, you can do research on that because there's specific plants that, that are specific hosts for specific caterpillars. Um, let's see. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, I think I missed one. Oh, questions and answers. Well, let me go to more random pollinator facts. This is kind of, you know, just stuff. Uh, Amazon water lily, the size of a football, turns purple once it has been pollinated. Hummingbirds, use so much energy to hover while they feed, it would be like you needing 150 hamburgers. <clears throat> um, thousand insect species pollinate more than 250,000 flowering species. And that reminds me um, that I forgot to tell you that there are about 21,000 species of bees of which approximately 250 are bumblebees, 500 to 600 are stingless, and only seven, which is 0.003%, are honeybees. The remainder are solitary or native bees. Now the bumblebees aren't solitary. They have their own little colony, but they don't make honey. Um, but so 90%, 90% of the bees are solitary. Um, Okay, I missed a slide. Or, anyway, um, honey bee, bees fly seven miles per hour and have to beat their wings 190 times a second. Um, nectar eating bats and moths prefer white flowers. We have a bat house up in the demo garden, but I haven't seen anybody move in. Uh, male bees cannot sting, wasps are carnivores, and we don't even want to think about them. Um, California grows 80% of the world's almonds. 
Uh, bumblebees create an electric charge when they fly, which causes the pollen to jump onto them. Um, that's interesting. Um, that's in, that it is in, interesting. They're not bumblebees are a little hairy. Carpenter bees are shiny, um, but most of the native bees are a little hairy or a little sticky. Um, but the electric charge is, is that's a pretty nifty fact. Um, here we go. This is where I was before. Um, those are strange facts. Okay, back to questions and answers. Anybody have any questions? Hang on just a second. I lost my chat box. Okay. Um, well, we do have a question on beekeepers. I'm not, not sure how familiar you are if, if, um, about beekeepers and how they, they'll move the hives around to pollinate different yeah. types of crops. Um, no, I, I don't know anything about honeybees. I mean, I don't know. I don't have, I, I'm a native bee person. Yeah, that, that's more of a question for a beekeeper. Right. Uh, so there is a key, beekeepers association in Loudoun County, if you want to Google that and, and perhaps ask about that. Someone else is asking if the slides will be available to view. Yes. We if can, what? I'm sorry, what? I didn't understand what you said. The, another question was, will the slides be available to view later? And yes, we do put them up on our um, agroecology hub and I will write that. Um, I have to, I have to remove normally from for remote control to be able to go in to get that for you. But those are the two questions that, that we have. Okay. Um, there's lots of great information out there for people to uh, find out about pollinators. You can also come out to the demonstration garden. And um, when we have regular work days, as soon as this lockdown or pandemic is, is over with, um, we're located at Idley Park in Leesburg. And um, we usually work Tuesdays and Thursdays from nine to noon. Um, we have a help desk, of course, at the um, extension office, then, which is being um, online right now. But um, if you come out and visit us, we, we can talk to you about pollinators and you can see how we grow for them. So I thank you very much and I hope you got something out of it. We got one more question. Okay. Okay, there's a yep. question about cleaning the bee habitat. You mentioned that they need to overwinter, but the house might have disease or predators in it. So how do you know when to clean it? Well, the, um, if you're going to, you know, the best thing to do is to harvest the cocoons. Um, if you don't have, uh, you know, if you could get in the, in the springtime, if you leave, okay, if you leave the nests in there, and you can tell if there's nests in there, the mason bees uh, and the leaf cutter bees will, will fill a tube with five or six different cocoons, and at the end of the tube will be plugged up. Uh, the masons will be plugged with mud, uh, the leaf cutter bees will be plugged with leaf matter, and, uh, but it's, they mix it with their spit, so it's kind of, it's a plug. So if those um, are still intact, you know that the bees, the cocoons are either in there or they've been invaded by another animal, uh, an insect or a parasite. So it's kind of, it's kind of um, iffy, you know, I think that if you wait till late uh, winter or early spring and nothing has come out, I'd say take a hose and spray the heck out of it. And, um, and that'll clean it out a little bit. But the best thing to do is to not get one of those store-bought houses unless you can take the tubes out. If you can take the tubes out, that's fine. That way you can, you can either replace the tubes. That's why if you have the cardboard tubes, you can open them up or leave them out and, and it won't be that expensive um, and let them harvest themselves. Um, if you're not going to harvest them yourself. But if you go to crownbees.com, they have a lot of info 
they have webinars um, and they you can sign up for a monthly um, uh, email about what to do this month like this month is your may what to do is in may so um you know you i think that if you have a, a way to get the tubes out you're going to be okay and replace the tubes if you have to if you're going to use tubes over again you just need to be able to clean them out somehow with a long q-tip and a little bit of a 10 percent bleach something like that but uh you don't want to you don't want to count on them if you're not going to clean them out. You don't want to count on the bees to, to harvest themselves. Okay, okay another um, kind, of, kind of a question. Uh, somebody put out a bird bath early in the season and noticed there were small bees that drowned in it. So she watched carefully and was able to pull, some, pull them out before they died. Have, have you ever seen this happen before? Yes, and this is why you always want to put rocks in your bird bath. Um, actually, somebody just asked me yesterday, why is the rock in the bird bath? And that's for either birds to perch or, you know, if you're, uh, if you're concerned about your pollinator bees and insects, you want to have something for them to be able to perch on and, you know, not drown by going into the water. Um, it may have been this erratic weather we have, um, you know, it, they may be out because it was warm and then got really cold and died and fell into your, your bird bath. But if I think if you keep pebbles or something that, that'll, that sticks out of the water a little bit that they can perch on, they probably won't drown. That's okay. Great advice, normally. And then the last question I have is, kind of bore along the lines of bee identification um, for bees that live in the ground. I don't know if you're familiar uh, with that. What's the, what's the question? Yeah, it's there's somebody has a colony in the ground. And oh. Bees can be aggressive. So I do have to step in and say as the uh, coordinator of the Master Gardeners, uh, we, we can't, you know, we're visually, we can't tell you what they can be um, or can't be. If you want to try to snap a picture and send it to our help desk, yeah, we'll be able to help identify. It. Um, that's just yeah. The the um, the aggressive ones aren't uh, <clears throat> aren't bees; they're wasps. You know, um, so you want to definitely be careful of them. So you do need to. You need. It's just like uh, picking out a pest. Uh, you know, picking out a pesticide. I, I want to spray something because there's something on my plant. Well, you need to know what that something is and you need to know the proper thing to, to spray on them if you, if you want to eliminate them. So uh, Barb's right, uh, send a picture into our help desk. Right, and then on that note, I do want to make sure that whoever is still on the session, the murder hornets are um, not in Virginia. They are barely even in the state of Washington and the ones that were found in Washington have been eradicated. Right. So please don't go killing any type of pollinator you see thinking that it might be uh, a murder hornet uh, because it is not here in Virginia. Thank you, Barb. Yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay. And, and then uh, another question. Do you, can you talk a little bit more about bats as pollinators? Well, um, uh, well, I'm not quite sure of what to tell you. I don't, uh, um, I have never, never dealt with them. That's why I put the, um, uh, the bat house up so I could, but I do know that they are out at night and they, that's why they like white flowers because the white flowers are usually the ones that are blooming at night and are visible. And that's why, that's what makes nature so amazing. Um, because they need to, they know that they, they need to be um, there for, for bats that, that want to pollinate. Um, but other than that, no, I, I, I really don't know uh, anything else. They, yeah. do need, they do need water. Um, I, have, I did some research on how to place a bat house, and it needs to be facing 
south or east, which is the same same um, direction that a B hotel needs to to be facing, um, and it needs to be near a source of water, um, and you need to have night blooming, especially white plants. That's about it. That's it. Fantastic. I, I I'm assuming that they're flying from flower to flower, so when they do that, yeah. Yeah, it's a, they're a pollinator. They do the same thing. Yeah, right. It's just a, something to think about, isn't it? Yes. All right. So we have a, another question on when is the best time to clean out the rods for the bees? Um, you, the nesting tubes. I believe. I, I guess that's what they mean. Um, yeah. Well, you want to put new ones out in the in the spring and and the mason bees come out start coming out when it's consistently 50 degrees out so you'll want to have your your nesting tubes in place by that time so anytime before that what i do is because the mason bees are a spring bee and and by you know mid-june it's the leaf cutter bees so i change out my mason bee tubes for which are eight millimeters or five sixteenths um and two um two millimeter i mean six millimeter for the spring leaf cutters and they're tiny tiny um and then i and so i harvest the the cocoons then in mid-june for the mason bees put them in a mesh bag and then put them in storage where it's cool um, the spring leaf cutters are go until, you know, the end of um, September, something like that. Sorry about that. That's my answering machine. <laughs> uh, spring leaf cutters are the end, you know, the end of September is pretty much when they're done. Um, and you, I mean, it depends on whether you're harvesting the cocoons or not. You could leave them. Uh, out because you're gonna, you know, wait for them to, you know, harvest themselves in the spring and summer, or you can get rid of them if you're gonna harvest them at the end of their time. That's why going on to a site like um, Crown Bees, you can get all the information you need as far as um, when to do and what to do. And when they send you your, your monthly email and it tells you what to do for that month. Um, so, you know, it's all all by the end of the year or by the the beginning of next year. You know, you want to have everything ready by the time spring and uh, summer come around for the for those two bees. And there's of course the, the other bees, the nesting, the ground nesting bees, the bumblebees. Um, you just want to make sure you have some open bare ground around, and you don't have to worry about it. And don't be pouring anything weird down a hole that you don't know what B it is, please. Um, I hope that answers your question. It's, um, yeah, anyway. Okay, that's it. That's all the questions we have. Great. I did, I did post the sites where you can find um, not only this recorded uh, classroom series, but the, the whole BCE Loudon has quite a few topics that you might be interested in. So that's posted in the link in the chat box. Good. So for now, we'll say goodbye and everybody stay safe out there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Barb. Thanks everybody.